Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Ryan Moore, and you can find me on Twitter at uh, panic whenever. So uh, that panic is uh, now. <laughs> but uh, I'm an engineer at a company at MX. Uh, we're based out of Utah in the United States. Uh, and we basically do all things uh, financial data and financial UI. I know that there's a lot of people in the uh, functional programming space that um, are also in the financial uh, data and financial tech space. So if you're into that, come talk to me. I also um, have been uh, part of starting uh, a, a program that teaches uh, refugees Java in Utah. And so um, if you're interested in talking about how to give back to your communities with some of the uh, um, skills that you have, I'd also love to talk to you about that. And I'm also a musician, uh, per, uh, uh, very interested especially in experimental music. So I am super excited for what's coming up next with uh, Lambda Calculus Beep Boop. I think that's going to be right up the unique Venn diagram of my interest today. Um, I've had a great day today. It's been a great conference. A big thanks to everyone at FlatMap for having us. And uh, let's get started. Uh, so um, uh, my talk is going to be... Um, um, actually about, maybe, yeah, here we go. Um, so we've got uh, from NAND to Lambda, and so we're talking about foundational computing through functional principles. And so uh, this last year, I actually um, have been spending a lot of time um, with uh, a book, Haskell Programming from First Principles, and I'm sure that um, many of y'all are familiar with this. But the unique thing about this uh, programming book is that instead of jumping right into the nitty and gritty of how to get stuff done, it builds you up from the very basics of lambda calculus to talking about types and type classes, um, algebraic data types, and then you know, semigroups and monoids and functors, all the, the big words that we've been uh, hearing thrown out today. And it does it in such a way that by the time you kind of get to the point where you get to the chapter on, on monads, you almost feel a little bit disappointed because the mystery that has been built up that uh, is completely masked away, right? Because they built it up from things that are uh, so um, foundational that uh, there's no surprise once you get there. And so um, I also this year uh, took a course um, called Nantetetris, Nantetetris um, uh, Build a Modern Computer from First Principles. And uh, this course uh, t teaches hardware engineering and um, uh, compilers and programming languages and even operating systems in much the same uh, methodology as the Haskell book does, where it starts at the very bottom of uh, the foundations that are the building blocks of computing, uh, logic gates. And it uses those to build arithmetic gates, which are then used to build an arithmetic logic unit, which is then used to build a CPU. And they, uh, then you build a, a register, which is then uh, built into RAM. And eventually, um, you're uh, writing an um, a assembler that can take uh, assembly language and uh, turn it into machine code. Um, and all the way up until all of a sudden you have a computer. And as I was studying these two things, I found that um, you know, maybe a lot of times when people talk about functional programming, it's uh, put into this area where, you know, it's, it's not as um, uh, relevant or it's not as useful or it's less about performance and more about these uh, big ideas. And so you'd think that when you came to hardware engineering, there wouldn't be much in common. But um, maybe just because I was studying both of them at the same time, and they both had first principles in the title, uh, I felt like uh, there actually was quite a bit in common. And so here's some of the stuff we're going to be talking about today, and it's quite a lot, so um, I'm going to try to move through as we can. But uh, um, we're uh, going to be talking about uh, combina combinatorial Boolean circuitry, exciting fun function composition patterns, um, some uh, monoidal arithmetic circuitry, and uh, monadic sequential circuitry, and hopefully along the way we'll be having a lot of fun. So um, to begin out, we're going to introduce a language. And uh, this language is based entirely on function input and output. It relies on composition of those functions for portability and reusability. It's declarative, not imperative in nature. And it encodes its side effects in a type. And so if I you know, came out and said nothing more and we didn't know that we were perhaps talking about hardware engineering, maybe you'd be thinking, is this a brand new compiles to JS language that uses type safety and monads to compose UIs? 
Um, maybe this is one of these cool semi-Turing uh, complete languages, uh, configuration languages that have gone rogue and, and, rogue and are now taking over. Or, you know, since we're at a, a functional programming conference about the JVM, maybe we're introducing finally the one language that will unite all the tribes of JVM programmers under a single banner. But no. What we're talking about is hardware description language. So this is a language, um, a group of languages really, uh, that their purpose is to allow programmers or engineers to build uh, physical engineering circuits without having to worry about exactly um, the position of each transistor or resistor or capacitor. And so it provides a safe abstraction level for them to um, build small chips with human language and then uh, just as uh, 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 programming languages have compilers often, uh, these hardware description languages have synthesizers which take the hardware language and they turn it, in, they synthesize it into the actual physical uh, elements. And uh, I have to say, uh, for someone coming from a music background, this was completely new for me. And it was very exciting because I, you know, have worked, um, um, you know, with, with different uh, programming languages that uh, go to the JVM, but everything underneath that was a complete black box for me. I had no idea. Thinking about how um, the compiler messages somehow would be interpreted by something like a CPU was just mind-boggling. I had no idea. And um, uh, let's take a look at what this uh, kind of language looks like. So, um, at the stop, at the, at, the t at the top here, we have a chip declaration. This means that this block of code that we're looking at is a chip, and it gets a name, and we can name it whatever we want. Uh, and then uh, the uh, next two lines are going to be the ends of the chips, which are representations of the formal uh, wires that are being inputted into the chips. And then we have the out. And um, one small difference here uh, from uh, uh, functions is that we can have both many ins and many outs here because we can have uh, lots of physical wires coming in, lots of physical wires coming out. And uh, then at the next step, you see we have the parts. And so this uh, contrived example uh, presupposes that we have a built-in chip named uh, built-in chip, uh, pretty creatively. <laughs> and uh, this chip itself has two inputs, an A input and a B input. And so what's happening here is we're taking the physical wire of the in A and we're wiring that to the A input of the built-in chip and the B and we're wiring that to the B input. And then the built-in chip has an out. And instead of taking that out and piping it out directly through um, my chip, what we're going to do is we're going to create um, our own new wire. And just this wire is going to have a name just like variables have names, right? and this wire we're going to call myvar. And we take myvar and we wire that in to the next built-in chip. And uh, instead of wiring it into just one of the inputs, we actually wire it into both inputs, which is also something we can do in this language. And then finally, we wire it out. And so um, the thing that, the first thing that stood out to me right off the bat of looking at this is that uh, this language is actually completely declarative and not imperative in nature. So even though a built-in chip and then built-in chip are on separate lines, these do not happen one step after the other. They happen simultaneously. The electricity turns on and it just goes throughout the whole chip. And so um, having a little bit of Haskell and functional programming um, under my belt uh, really made this um, a lot easier for me to reason about. Um, the, f the first time I, I sat down with FP and somebody said, oh, you, you can't do things in order, I was just lost, right? <laughs> I felt like all my tools as a programmer had been taken away from me. But when I got to this step here, um, I was like, oh yeah, this is going to be fine. These are just uh, inputs and outputs, and they have you know, relational equality, all the things people have been talking about today. And so uh, this course, right, it's called From NAND to Tetris. So what's the big deal with NAND? Well, um, NAND is a gate um, that is the negation of the AND function, basically. And so uh, it produces the output low when given two high inputs, um, which is the equivalent of producing a false when given two trues or producing a zero when given two ones. Um, 
And for all other inputs, it, produce, it um, produces a high input. And the fascinating thing about this is that from this uh, single function or chip, we can build out all Boolean combinatorial logic, which we can then use to build out all arithmetic. Um, and even from this chip, we can build out uh, digital flip-flops, which are used as the foundation for memory. And starting with just this one piece, we can use it over and over and over again, encapsulate it in different safe abstractions that are tested, move up higher and higher layers until we have the, the miracle that is the modern computer. And knowing that just sends chills down my spine. When you, it's like, uh, if, if there's anything, um, um, this is, if there's anything sacred or beautiful, I think that something like this is, right? It, almost like the, the form that from everything else can, that we have, that we, we, um, that we value, it can be made of. Okay, so we're going to do a little bit of live coding, unless I get too nervesy. Um, and I wanted to show that this stuff really is foundational, and you can kind of start from scratch and just build this stuff up, and it's actually not that big of a deal. And also, hopefully, you can see um, some of uh, Haskell in the hands of someone who's a little bit more basic and see that this language is actually maybe quite a bit uh, more approachable than it may seem otherwise. Um, so I didn't want to start with Booleans or zeros because those have built-in uh, things in the language and computing. And so we're going to create our own data tape, voltage. And voltage is going to be a sum type, and it is going to be either high or low. And um, those are the two options, uh, a nice little binary uh, uh, sum type. And then I'm just going to add a little deriving here. And we're going to do show and EQ. And this just uh, will help us um, print and um, uh, uh, print and uh, compare quality. And so uh, one of the cool things about Haskell. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Is that good enough, or should we go higher? OK. Um, so one of the cool things about Haskell is that it's, a, it's quite a flexible language, language, and it provides a lot of different ways to model problems. And so we can often um, have a Haskell function that looks almost exactly like the uh, documentation for our problem. So if we looked at uh, NAND before, we knew that if it takes uh, two highs, then it will return a low. And uh, if it takes a high and a low, then it will return a low. And if it takes a low and a high, it will be, oh, sorry, I've already messed it up. There we go. And uh, if we uh, give it two lows, um, we will get a high, right? And so this looks almost exactly, well, it is exactly like our truth table, right? And uh, from this, we'll go ahead and fire up our REPL. And looks like we're still doing OK. And we'll load in NAND. And we can see that this is going to function as we expect. High, high makes a low. High, low makes a high. High, low makes a high. And it's working as expected. And this is cool, but we can also eliminate some of this and just say, hey, um, the formal definition that we're given is two highs is a low. Anything else is a high. So we can also just replace our inputs with underscores to show that they're saying they are anything else and say uh, two highs equals a low. Anything else will be a high. And this is going to work um, uh, just the same way. Boom, boom, boom. Um, so now we've got NAND. We're ready to start building out some other uh, more interesting things. So this is what uh, not looks like in HDL. And, uh, this was one of the exercises that actually kind of like threw me for a loop a little bit because you have so little to work with. Uh, but the fascinating thing is, is if you wire a single input to both inputs of the NAND, if that input is true, then the output will be false. And if that input is false, um, then the output will be true. And so essentially, if we take in a high voltage and wire high, high to the NAND, it will return low. And if we take in a low and wire low, low to the NAND, it will turn high, which is our not. And so let's go ahead and take a look at this, how this kind of thing would look in Haskell. And I think if there's space, I will try to bring up the HDL over here. Does that look OK to you all? OK. 
Um, so not is going to take in a single voltage. And, um, you know, one way we could do this is similar to the truth table, right? Where we could say high is low, and then we could also say low is high, right? Um, but we want to demonstrate that we can reuse an AND. And so instead, we're going to mirror what we have here um, in the HDL, and we can say that not is the result of NAND with X and X. And so now, if we go ahead and load up uh, source combinatory boolean, uh, we can actually see that our not prime given a low will give us a high, and not prime given a high will give us a low. And I've just given these uh, primes because there are already uh, functions built into the prelude that conflict with these. Um, but these are, uh, so we see that it works, hooray. And look how similar this looks. The NAND, A in, B in, out, out. If you kind of squint a little, you know, the squint test, you can almost say that they look the same. So let's go ahead and take um, a look at AND in HDL. So now that we've got NAND and not, it's uh, trivial, right? Uh, since NAND is the negation of AND, if we negate the negation, then we get the original thing, right? Okay, well, it sounded trivial before I started explaining it. But, um, but if you look here, um, again, we have uh, uh, these chips, and they can act just like pure functions. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this will be. And so let's say we take in here, and I'll bring up the and.hdl. Um, and so from here, we can see, and I'll actually give this the a and the b so that they have the same names even. And we can see the not prime of NAND, A and B. And if we load this up, uh, we can now see AND prime, high, high, and AND prime, low, low, um, et cetera. And then uh, just as a little preview of some stuff we're going to get into later on, I can remove these parentheses and insert this dollar sign, which is a function application. And all this says is, the function not is going to be applied to the result of everything that comes next. And, um, and I just want to, sometimes this uh, Haskell syntax, for people who haven't seen it, can be a little bit um, um, intimidating, uh, but uh, there's really not too much to it. And so um, here is uh, what we might see with a AND16. Uh, this is the example of our AND circuit that instead of taking in a single two bits, or, or two bits and producing uh, a single bit, is going to take in two 16-bit buses and return a 16-bit bus. And as you can see, this is a little bit unwieldy. And I want to take this moment to uh, uh, you know, make sure that it's, it's uh, obvious that this uh, HDL hardware description language, this flavor of it that I'm using right here, is demonstrated for education purposes, right? And so modern HDLs will have uh, loops or recursion schemes, so you don't have to manually type it out here. Um, but the authors of the course want to uh, demonstrate, in a, you know, they have to go through the whole history of building a computer, so they've got to simplify some things. But uh, even though this is simplified, it still is as functional as any other hardware description language. Um, you know, maybe a little bit harder to develop in, but it's a real language. And excitingly enough, as I was going through this, it turns out that there are hardware description languages that are actually built in uh, Haskell, and even uh, people are starting to work on ones in Idris and Scala. And so there are, are lots of these that um, uh, use the conveniences that we're used to. And here I want to talk, this is going to be a little bit of a sidetrack, but this was kind of the first real exciting interplay that I had personally when working with these two. And in order to talk about that, we need to talk about function composition. So in Haskell, this uh, period or dot is the composition operator. And since it has parentheses around it, that means it's an infix operator. And all that means is that you use it uh, the same way you use like a plus or a multiplication in arithmetic. It goes in between the two operators instead of before it. And the way that this works is it allows us to take two functions, say an f and g, that both accept a single argument and produce a single result. And we can compose them together such that f is called with the result of g applied with x. And sometimes what we say here is um, f composed with g is f of g of x. And so a little quick example of this. Imagine we want to convert our voltage to a Boolean type. So we create a function, voltage to Boolean. Uh, in input voltage, output Boolean. 
And then we have a contrived example of a, another function that takes a single argument um, that uh, uses our not function that we created earlier that just goes ahead and knots a Boolean, um, knots our voltage. And uh, maybe um, we can show that these can actually be uh, composed uh, in this way, that voltage to Boolean composed with not is the same as calling voltage to Boolean with these parentheses around it. And um, another interesting thing is that whenever you have a function argument in, in uh, Haskell that is doing nothing but being applied to another function, you can actually just remove it. And so this is what is called edit reduction or point free style. And so we can have a new function that is simply the result of the composition of two other functions. So that's kind of exciting. And talk about, you know, is it, this is what we all get asked with FP, right? That sounds fun, but is it useful? Can you get a job with it, right? And the answer is yes. But um, I, I spend a lot of my um, days, uh, these days, working with JavaScript. And I see a lot of stuff like this where we, um, have um, some util module with a uh, function being passed an argument, and then you just have lines and lines of assignment with nothing happening but functions being called from other modules uh, with single arguments. And there's just a lot of opportunity here um, for stuff to get out of order in an unexpected way and or for somebody to sneak something in that has nothing to do with it and violates separation of concerns. And it sure would be nice if in my day-to-day -day I had a function composition operator that um, also makes this really easy to read. Uh, convert composed with 2RGB, composed with an add alpha of 0.5. The intent of this code is obvious. And there's no uh, spaces left for people to sneak a little bug fix that is going to have cascading side effects that I can't predict. So here is my question. I know that I can compose uh, two functions with single arguments together, but right now what I've got is a not that takes a single argument, and I've got a nand which takes two. So if f of g of x can be f of g, can f of g of x and y also be composed together? And I'm going to warn you, it's going to get a little bit dicey here in a second. But um, just stay with me. And also, I want to upfront say that this is mainly for fun. And, um, but uh, this kind of thing uh, just really tickled my brain. Um, so we take our um, idea and we assign it to uh, this can it compose. So we have f and g. These are two functions that accept single values. And then x and y, these are our values. And then we have f called with g of x and y. So our first step when we want to see if we can compose something like this together is to convert it to a lambda. So now we've got the exact same thing. f and g are functions, x and y are values, f of g of x and y. And then we're going to use that dollar uh, sign, the function application, to remove the parentheses. So now we've got f uh, dollar sign g x and y. But nothing crazy's happened yet. So this, I think, is the step, the trickiest step for me. But if we follow the types of compose and application, then uh, we can make it to the end. So um, we have introduced a composition where the application, and then we've kind of jumped the application a couple steps down the line. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the application operator, it expects a function to come before it that accepts a single argument, and it accept, expects a single argument to come after it. And so g of x is actually going to, since it's curried, is going to return a function that's a single argument. And so g of x is going to resolve into a function of a single argument and be applied to this value. Now f is going to be composed with something. And f wants to be composed with a function that accepts a single argument. And since we've got our dollar sign that says, hey, what came before is going to be applied to what comes after, we actually have satisfied both of these operators because g of x is a function that accepts a single argument. And so by playing with this, we've, we've moved it around and we're still in a good place. Now we can use uh, the rule that I brought up earlier that we can eliminate arguments that are only passed to other functions. And we've got f composed with g of x. And this is still a pretty reasonable place to be in, I think. But where we're going to go from here on out is straight up goofy. Um, 
So we're going to start by separating the f composition and the g of x with parentheses to make this a little bit more explicit. And then we're going to use our little dollar signs trip to remove the parentheses around g. And now we're going to do that, uh, basically the same dollar sign composition hop that we did before. But at this point, this is where it starts getting crazy, because we've got the partial composition of f composed with g applied to x. And I'm just going to say that this type of thing, um, if, if your brain does what my brain when you see this type of thing does, then I apologize for all the free time that you're about to lose. Um, sorry, not sorry. But um, we uh, can eliminate that uh, variable that is being done nothing to but being applied. And now we end up with the partial composition of f composed with g. And whooey, uh, since we're living our best Haskell life, we're going to take everything that's ugly and then just hide it behind a cute infix operator, and we're good to go. And so not NAND of x and y can indeed compose with not dot, dot, dot NAND. And so I'm going to demonstrate this really quickly uh, with uh, I got this uh, Blackbird module. It's importing uh, a few uh, files that I've written. And then it's also importing this data.rvary.birds, which is assigning uh, the Blackbird to an infix operator dot, dot, dot. And we can see not composed with, we've got to make sure to use the right ones, does indeed compile. And we can actually see that and uh, prime prime of high is high, and am prime prime of low is low, and everything in the middle. Now, if that's not uh, cool and absurd, I do not know what either of those words mean, um, but I love it. And so maybe at this point, um, you're asking, what's with that data aviary dot, uh, package in Blackbird? And so this is uh, the other half of the rabbit hole that I got stuck under. So uh, combinatory la logic was uh, largely developed by this fellow named Haskell Curry. Sounds familiar, right? And Haskell Curry, it turns out, was an extremely avid bird watcher. And there was a fellow named Raymond Smallman who wrote a celebration of combinatory logic puzzles um, called To Mock a Mockingboard, um, basically because he knew that Haskell was an avid bird watcher. And he introduces the Blackbird Combinator, which is just what we walked through in this book. And um, somebody in uh, Haskell and also in the JavaScript land and fantasy land, and I believe in Scala, th these ha have produced these aviary packages, which are largely for fun, but are also super interesting and you know, useful, if a bit insane. But um, uh, the combinatory logic that Haskell Curry developed is functionally equivalent to Lambda Calculus, and of course, Haskell is Lambda Calculus. And this is some of the great stuff, the, the, the feelings that I get from studying this stuff is that a, a lot of other languages where you get to dead ends and people are like, oh, no, you can't do that, or it's just, um, it just is this way because, or this is an exception. I find the more that I study Haskell, the more everything just comes together into a coherent, if um, slightly mind-bending whole, um, whole part and making me feel all sparkly and wiggly arms. And so, OK, back to some more down-to-earth biz. So binary arithmetic. In order to do binary arithmetic, uh, the first thing that we're wanting to do is develop something called a half adder. And the goal of a half adder is to take two bits, um, say a 0 and a 0, and produce uh, two bits, a sum bit and a carry bit, right? So with uh, Boolean arithmetic, uh, 0 plus 0 is going to be 0 with a carry of 0. 1 and 0, or 0 and 1, is going to be 1 with a carry of 0. And then uh, 1 and 1 is going to be 0 with a carry of 1. And so when we want to make the journey from Boolean stuff to uh, arithmetic, uh, this is the first chasm we have to cross. And when we start looking at this, uh, if we take a look at the truth table for exclusive OR, we have true, true, false, 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 and everything else true. And if we look at the table of what we expect to get from our sum with our half adder, we see 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then everything else 1. And so from here, we can see that there's actually a path straight from the exclusive OR to the sum. And it turns out that this is not by accident, because both of these are monoids. And um, 
If we take the and, we see that we have true, 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 everything else false. And if we look at our carry, we see uh, one, 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 and everything else zero. And we have now uh, a direct uh, uh, line over to get our carry. And also, not surprising because under the hood, both of these are monoids. And if we take a look at how this is implemented in HDL, we see the following. We have our exclusive OR with the A and the B piped out to our sum, and we have the AND with our A and a B piped out to carry. And I just threw out that word monoid as people who um, have been uh, learning Haskell for a little while or want to do, um, but we're gonna talk about what it is. So this is a algebraic structure with an associative binary operation and identity element. And so um, in Haskell, this looks like this, where we have a monoid A, um, M append or map end of A to A to A, and a mempty of A. And we're gonna take a look now about how this actually looks like in code. Um, when you're around people that start getting into this stuff, they start saying uh, things along the line of, um, oh, like once you learn monoids, you're gonna start um, seeing them everywhere, right? And it's, uh, it can be frustrating up until the point where you start seeing them everywhere, and then you become one of the people that is saying, hey, once y'all start learning, learning monoids, you're gonna start seeing them everywhere, and uh, the irony is lost on you, right? But, um, so here, um, we have to make a new type, because uh, in Haskell, our, um, monoids can only have an instance of a single type, and we're gonna to wanna to have exclusive OR monoids and, and monoids of our voltage. And so we make an exclusive OR of A, which is gonna wrap our voltage, and uh, for the mempty, we give it a low. And it can be kind of confusing sometimes at first to think about like what this mempty or identity value is, and what I like to think of it is, is the mempty is the mirror. So whatever looks into the mirror sees itself. So if we do an exclusive OR, with low and low, it's gonna come back low. And um, if we do an exclusive OR with low and high, it's gonna come back high. So the high looks into the low and it sees itself. The low looks into the low and it sees itself. Once you start thinking about it that way, it gets a little bit mind twisty. And then um, from append here, um, we simply say, um, this is our, our truth table. Um, we could also re-implement this in terms of NAND as before. Um, uh, it just depends on whichever way you, you feel like seeing it. And now for the, uh, the voltage AND, we have something very similar, except for the empty value for AND is high. And so if you uh, send in a high to high, it's gonna see itself, a high. And if you send in a low to high with AND, it's gonna see itself, it's gonna be a low. So, um, once we have these, let's take a look at doing our half adder in Haskell. And I will go ahead and bring up half adder HDL. And the cool thing is, is that once again, this is gonna look really, really uh, similar. So half adder is gonna take in two voltages. Um, we'll say an A and a B. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, assign these to a sum and a carry tuple. And then we're gonna work out what that actually is under here. So we're gonna have a little where clause. And we're gonna say, um, XOR of sum equals XOR of A, map end, XOR of B, and then we're going to say uh, AND of carry is the same of AND of A, map ended to the AND of B. We're going to pray that this compiles, it does, which normally means that we're um, footloose and fancy free. <laughs> And so now we can see that if we take a half adder and we pass it in low and low, what we expect is a tuple that is gonna be low with the sum and low with the carry, which is right. Uh, high of low, perfect. And then high of high, we should see a low and high. Great, so we're in business. Next, we have our full adder. And so we, we, we have our sum, but we threw our carry out into the, in, into the darkness, right? And we just forgot about it. This is where we catch it. And so full adder takes uh, two bits and a third carry bit and adds them together. And this is what the truth table for it looks like. Uh, one, one, one uh, comes with ones for sum and carry. One and one and zero is zero and one. 
uh, one zero zero is one and zero, and then finally zero zero zeros. This is what it looks like in HDL, and we can see that we can compose our half adder, our half adder with our or. And since we know that um, uh, uh, addition, binary addition and integer addition are uh, associative concatenative operations, that means that we can encapsulate this type with monoids all the way down to, right? So half adders made of monoids, and then we're going to add, use two half adders and an or monoid uh, to accomplish this for full adders. So let's bring up the HDL and the Haskell. And so uh, once again, um, uh, this is going to now take in an A and a B and a C. I'll bring this up a little bit. And uh, we're returning again a sum and a carry tuple. We're going to use the same where pattern. And we're going to say um, uh, sum 1 and carry 1 is going to be the result of half adder of A and B. And then the sum and the carry 2 is going to be the result of half adder sum 1 and the carry value that's passed in. And then the carry is going to be the value contained by the monoid or when we map end an or of carry 1 and an or of carry 2. OK, looking good so far. And so now we can see full adder if we pass in low and low and low, tuple of low and low, high, and then high, 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 high. <laughs> OK, so pretty cool, huh? And uh, so now, uh, what about a monoidal NAND? So, uh, the issue with this is that actually NAND doesn't have an identity value. There's nothing that we can throw in at NAND that will consi con consistently give back itself. And then we could go one step lower. So a semigroup is an algebraic data structure with an associative um, binary operation, but no identity. But it turns out that NAND is also not associative. So there's not that much we can do with it. And, um, you know, this kind of seems a little bit strange at first because we start thinking about these type classes, semigroups, monoids, monads. They're so powerful, right? They can do so much. Um, but then this one little uh, tiny building block that we can build everything from doesn't seem to fit into any of them, right? And even if we made our own type class with a, with a, a binary operation, what would it be telling us? Merely that NAND can, has a binary operation. It doesn't tell us very much. So, you know, sometimes uh, in, this, in the comic book superhero world, they say, um, with great powers comes great responsibility. And um, I think that's kind of a, a bullshit way to lead your life, engineering-wise. Because if the superheroes don't guard themselves, then who, who takes care of it, right? Who watches the watchmen? Um, and so with functional programming, we actually have um, uh, the uh, responsibility of having these, these powers or types, type classes um, means that there's actually less and less they can do. And so when um, we have NAND, it's a, 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 any kind of binary operation, right? But by um, putting on the capes and the tights of these uh, different type classes, we actually get more safety, uh, not less, as we go through, and kind of um, a little bit sometimes um, um, counterintuitive is the fact that actually um, these higher kind of higher these uh, these uh, uh, type classes are actually in some ways constrictive right and through the application of these laws we get the power to do the things we want in a safe way okay so we've talked a lot about um, booleans this function composition arithmetic but now it's come to the time that happens to every functional programmer when somebody comes up to you and says, that's cool, but can you actually do anything with it, right? Uh, we need at some point to have an effect. We need to have um, input and output not from functions, but from the real world. We need to manage state. And this is where our sequencing circuits come in. And we're going to run straight through this. Um, but, and I have till five.
Okay, so we're going to go through this super quickly. Um, we have um, our um, something called a digital flip-flop. And this uh, circuit right here has the ability to uh, maintain state. And it has two stable um, positions. One is here, where we have 0 and 0 and 1 and 1 coming in. And a second one is here, where 1 and 1. And the crazy thing about this is this is actually made up of two of our NAND circuits that are wired back into each other. And um, this is something that you're not really allowed to do with combinatorial logic. We can't pipe the inputs of our ANDs back into each other. It stops making mathematical or real-world sense. I came across this tweet. Um, if you ever code something that feels like a hack and it just works, just remember that a CPU is literally a rock that we tricked into thinking. I thought that was pretty great, but then it turns out that's literally what's happening here. This NAND is a trick. These, this, this wiring of two NAND gates in to get state is a trick, right? And just like we do in FP when uh, we need to do our side effects and our state, we wrap these things in monads that control and make what's going, the dangerous stuff opaque from the rest of our program. Um, physical computing engineers um, use the digital flip-flop to contain this sort of insanity at a lower level. And with this, you can compose it all the way up to RAMs and, uh, and, and get memory. So in closing, I've got uh, a bunch of resources and a GitHub repo with all this code. And thank you so much for your time.